Well, good morning. Today is the day that the Lord has made. So I will rejoice and be glad in it. Question, are you glad this morning? Amen. 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 Well, it's good to see you all here this morning as we come together to worship. And uh, I just uh, pray that a lot of times I find myself taking God's grace, His mercies, His goodness for granted. And uh, I pray this morning as we sing these songs and as we open our scriptures today that uh, we would think upon the grace that God extends to us, uh, not just every once in a while, but all the time. So as we stand, let's sing. What a beautiful name he is. You were the word at the beginning. One with God, the Lord Most High. Hid in glory in creation, now revealed in you, our Christ. What a beautiful name it is! What a beautiful name it is! The name of Jesus. name it is nothing compares to this what a beautiful name it is the name of Jesus I didn't want heaven without so Jesus you brought that 
could save a wretch like me. I once was lost, but now I was blind, but now I see. T'was grace that taught my heart, and grace my fears relieved. How precious did that set free my God my Savior has ransomed me and like a flood His mercy brings unending love amazing grace and you have no What a powerful name it is. Nothing can stand against. What a powerful name it is. The name of Jesus. What a powerful name it is. The name of Jesus. What a powerful name it is. The name of Jesus. You may be seated like to welcome you this morning to Northwoods Church. Uh, it's good singing this morning about the Lord's amazing grace and then his name and what a beautiful name it is and his powerful name. Good singing as we begin the service this morning. Very grateful that you've chosen to worship here this morning and for those of you this is your church and glad to see you here today as well. If you have a bulletin I'd ask you to grab it. You'll notice one uh, they're spread out on your seats and uh, yet, not yet guys it's all good. I see confusion. A couple of things. One is you'll see a connect card, and when you see the connect card, I'd ask you to fill the very front of it out, and uh, we'll put this in the offering box on our way out. And then on the back of the connect card, uh, you'll see some different opportunities for you to um, connect with the ministries of our church. Uh, potentially, you'll see some opportunities today to um, respond to the sermon and uh, some things you may want more information on or communicate to us prayer requests. Any prayer requests you turn in, I'll promise you, they are being prayed over through the week. And so I just want to encourage you, uh, let us know how we can minister alongside of you. And so uh, please let us know that. And if there are any kids that are in the room, you'll notice that there's a second piece of paper that's in the, the bulletin as well. It's a kid's worship guide. And uh, maybe there are some larger kids in the room who want to participate with that as well. And that's good. As, that's good. Um, we're here today um, to worship the Lord. And I want to encourage you to put your focus on Him. Um, many Sunday mornings, our attention is scattered. And uh, it's sort of scattered oftentimes throughout the week. But maybe right now, um, even as we've sung, your mind has been elsewhere. Uh, could I encourage you right now that we would put our attention on the Lord and the best way I know to do that is let's talk to Him. And so would you bow with me and let's pray. Let's focus on the Lord.
Father, I come to you today and I recognize you are the King of kings and the Lord of lords. You're the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end. You are our hope. Lord, there are uh, many things that come into our life that pull us away from you. Lord, we fail you consistently and often. But I come to you now. And I'm grateful that while we were still sinners, you died for us. I am grateful for your love. I am grateful for grace. I am grateful for the hope that we find in the person of Jesus Christ who paid the price for our sins. And I pray that, Lord, as we continue to sing, we would be reminded of you. We would be reminded of your grace. And we would be reminded of the hope that we have in you. We thank you for the opportunity you give us today to worship you. Thank you. In Jesus' name, amen. Would you stand with us as we continue to sing to the Lord? Yea, though I walk through the valley, I know that you are always right beside me, and I will fear no evil you're my rock and my strength you comfort me amazing grace how sweet the sound I hear you singing over me I once was lost but now I am found it's beautiful amazing grace how sweet the sound it covers every part of me my soul is silent, I am found, and it's a beautiful sound, it's a beautiful, beautiful sound. It's a beautiful sound. It's a beautiful, beautiful sound. You were healing in the pain. You were sheltered in the storm. Hallelujah, you restored my soul. You were healing in the pain. You were sheltered. over me. I once was lost, but now I am found. Amazing grace, how sweet the sound. It covers every part of me. My soul is silent. I am found. And it's a beautiful sound. Jesus, 
grace that exceeds our sin and our guilt. Yonder on Calvary's mount outpour, where with the blood of the Lamb was spilled. Marvelous in this grace freely bestowed on all who believe you who are longing to see his face will you this moment his grace receive have your Bibles this morning, would you take them and turn with me to the book of 2 Samuel, 2 Samuel chapter 9. How many of you uh, made a mistake this week? How many of y'all made mistakes this week? The rest of you lie. Okay. So uh, I'm going to begin with telling you a mistake I made, okay? Um, so I outlined this sermon series, The Rise and Fall of a King, seven sermons. This is the first time Marvin's hearing about it right now, so here you go, Marvin. Uh, I had seven sermons. They're in chronological order, okay? I preached the first one, David becoming a king, okay? Second one, David killed Goliath. I had in my head, had in my head, you, you got the danger of that. I had in my head the next sermon was David was with Mephibosheth. So immediately, Sunday afternoon in the last week, I started working on the next sermon. It's very important for me to get the, to flip the, the page, go to the next sermon. Because if I don't, I just keep thinking about what I just preached. And I'm tired of what I just preached just like y'all are tired of hearing it, okay? So Thursday, Thursday, sermons in the bulletin. It hit me. I skipped an entire sermon. Like there was a sermon number three, and I'm preaching today sermon number four. So guess what y'all get next week? The sermon three. Just thought y'all would know. This is out of order I hope somebody enjoys this because it's meant for somebody. So today we're going to talk about grace and Mephibosheth out of 2 Samuel 9. I love this story. I don't know how many of you are familiar with it, but this is, uh, as you can tell, because I hurried up and I'm preaching it. And uh, I've, I think I've preached, I've, I've been preaching now for 34 years, and I think I've preached this today. It'll be about the third time in my life I will have preached this story. I just love this passage. So let, let, let's review. From the time of David being anointed king, killing Goliath, there was about 12 to 15 years that would pass before he would take the throne as king. After killing Goliath, he would go back to Jerusalem with Saul. And the top song on the billboard charts would be, because they were singing this when he came into town, Saul has killed his thousands. David is 10,000. No, no. First, that has two problems with it. First of all, 
it wasn't true. David had never killed 10,000. He'd killed one guy, Goliath. Secondly, it made Saul mad to the point that David would be attacked by Saul three times. He had a javelin, a spear thrown at him. He would ultimately develop a brotherly love with Jonathan, Saul's son. Jonathan, Saul's own son, would protect David over his father when Jonathan would be in line to be the future king. David would go on the run from Saul and he would have two opportunities to kill Saul as Saul would, while looking for David to kill him, would happen to go into a cave where David would be just by chance. And David would be told by his crew, kill him. And David would not. Boy, that sounds like a good sermon, doesn't it? Next week. <laughs> Oops. <laughs> Saul and Jonathan would ultimately die in battle. David would become king. He would become the first king of Judah, and Ishbosheth, one of Saul's sons, would lead the northern ten tribes of Israel. There would be a civil war until David is able to bring the country together. David desires to build a temple for the Lord. He desires the Ark of the Covenant to no longer be in a tent. David looks around one day, and he sees... Here he is living in a nice palace and the Lord's presence is out in a tent. The Lord would not allow him to have that honor to build the temple. But he, instead the Lord says your offspring would build it. So David would provide for the material so that it would be done well. David leads the country into a time of unparalleled peace as he defeats the Philistines and the Amorites. He defeats the armies that are set up against Israel. And everything is well. And it's the rise and the pinnacle of David being king. You get to 2 Samuel 9. Would you be kind enough to stand with me as we read the word of God? David said, verse 1, Is there still anyone Watch that word, anyone. Is there still anyone left of the house of Saul that I may show him kindness for Jonathan's sake? Let's pray. Father, I pray in the next few moments your Holy Spirit would be at work. I do believe, Lord, that you're in control of even my failures. And I believe this is supposed to be preached today and I pray you would use these next few moments for your glory in Jesus name amen you may be seated let's talk about grace the first thing notice grace is offered in chapter 9 verse 1 David in this pinnacle of success offers grace how does he do so I get the distinct impression that David is thinking about the past. He reminisces about Saul and more specifically about his brotherly love with Jonathan. Um, look, when those you love pass away, they don't pass away from our memories. And not only do they not pass away from our memories, uh, I don't, it is true that over time things get better but we never get over the loss and I, I think I think that's important for us to remember it is it's easier to live life through time but we never get over the loss and Saul and Jonathan were not just friends they were tight 
They were so tight that Jonathan was willing to give up. He was in succession to be the king. Jonathan loved David so much, he gave, would give his life for David and did so. David is sitting back one day and he's thinking about Jonathan. And he's thinking about Jonathan. He asked a question. Is there anyone left of the house of Saul that I may show him kindness for Jonathan's sake? David remembers some promises that he's made. Remembers those promises. Because when he and Jonathan were together, one of the things that, that first happened was David made covenants or promises with Jonathan. Let me give you an example of one of those. And he said it more than once. I just want to give you one. It's in 1 Samuel chapter 20, and I will put this on the screen, starting in verse 12. Jonathan said to David, The Lord, the God of Israel, be witness. Now, now I want you to pause there and catch. That's important. He's saying, Before God... When I have sounded out my father about this time tomorrow or the third day, behold, if he is well disposed toward David, shall I not then send and disclose it to you? But should it please my father to do you harm, the Lord do so to Jonathan, and more also if I don't disclose it to you and send you away, that you may go in safety. May the Lord be with you as he has been with my father if I'm still alive. Show me, watch this, the steadfast love of the Lord that I may not die. He says, you be kind to me. Now, and ultimately, in that same chapter, he's going to say, not only do you be kind to me, but be kind to my offspring. So, so what, what he, David wants, I, I, let me show you a word here. He, he, he says in verse 1, is there still anyone left of the house of the Saul that I may show him kindness? The word kindness. Um, okay, it's the word hesed in in the, in the Hebrew, it's, it, it's the Old Testament equivalent to the New Testament word grace. So it comes up in the Old Testament as steadfast love, as kindness, because when you, when you offer grace, it's kind. When you offer grace, it is steadfast love. But this moment of remembering past promises and fulfilling them, it's an offer of Grace, Because most new kings, they come in, they take over, they, they kill all of the previous king's family. So th there would be no question as to who is in charge. They remove all concern of future takeover. This is why when Herod heard from the wise men about a new king being born, what did, the, what did Herod do? He ordered all male children to be killed. Because kings had a tendency to be paranoid about their throne. They wanted no one to take it over. Notice another word in verse 1. Is there still anyone? Notice that word anyone left of the house of Saul. Is there anyone left? Notice what it doesn't say. It doesn't say is there, is there anyone nice in the house of Saul? Is there anyone qualified in the house of Saul? Is there anyone worthy in the house of Saul? Is there anyone that would remind me of Jonathan? Is there anyone not a jerk? Is there anyone sweet? Is there anyone that would be a good cook? Is there anyone who could fetch me some dinner? Is there anyone who would tell me some jokes? No. Is there anyone? The question in its core, is, it's based on the person making the offer, not on the other person. Grace is about God offering us grace, not on our worthiness to receive it. Look, in, in this passage, I want, I want to say this early. You and I have nothing to do with David. You and I are going to have everything to do with a guy named Mephibosheth. 
We have nothing to do with David. We have nothing to do with David. We have nothing to do with David. We have everything to do with a guy named Mephibosheth who has nothing to offer. And I'll, 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 I hope, I hope, I hope, I hope, I hope I'll be able to prove that. But notice in verse 1, grace is offered. And I am so grateful for Mephibosheth, who's not even named yet. And I've been saying that word all week so that I don't mess it up. But, but I want you to see that in verse 1, I'm grateful for Mephibosheth that there was an offer made. Second, notice the object of grace. Verse 2. Now there was a servant of the house of Saul whose name was Ziba, and they called him to David. So, so, so they, David asked the question, verse 1, and they, they said, well, okay, well, how are we going to figure that out? And they said, was well, anybody left in the house of Saul who could know the answer? So they go and they, 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 they look around and they find that there's a, a, a guy named Ziba. And Ziba, who was still, he, he could tell everybody, he could sort of go down the genealogical tree. And he, he went and he brought him before David and notice his answer. They called him to David, and the king said to him, Are you Ziba? He said, I am your servant. Verse 3, the king said, Is there not still someone, just anyone, of the house of Saul, that I may show him the kindness, or the hesed, the grace of God to him? Ziba said to the king, There is still son of Jonathan. He's crippled in his feet. Ziba's implying to the king, giving counsel. He, he, doesn't, he doesn't really want to tell him this. Look, look, David, you see this pretty castle you're in? It's this pretty palace you're in? There's a guy. But this place, man, he don't fit in. I mean, this is, this is like one of those places you've got to come in here and eat. You need a sport coat and tie. This guy not only doesn't fit in, this guy, this guy would have to come in on a wheelchair or with crutches. And he, he's he's going to, I mean, you're going to hear him coming. Clump, clump, clump. David, this guy's messed up. Yeah, he, there is one person. David. don't want him what is David's response I think this is really important verse 4 the king said to him where is he he doesn't say so how bad exactly is this he just says where is he why that's all David wants to do is give grace. Grace isn't picky. Doesn't look for those who deserve it. Because if you deserve it, it's not grace. Grace is God giving all of himself to those who have nothing to give back in return. God gave you himself and what can you give zip zero nada you and I we're clump clump we don't fit we're dead in our sins we're broken we're blinded we're an enemy of God. We're from the past cabinet that the, the kingdoms fight against. I think this, 
Watch Ziba, what he says in verse 4. Ziba said to the king, he's in the house of Makir, the son of Amiel. Watch this, at Lodabar. But low, low, low means no. I, I like it when it's simple. Low means no. And Debar means pasture. So what is it? Where, 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 where is this guy at? He's in a place of no pasture. So when, when, when they took the boy away, this boy Mephibosheth away, they took him to the place where there was no pasture, where there was no... You would never have gone to find this guy. He went out into the... He went, he went to Ten Buck too. He went to the place to where you, were, you weren't going to find him. One of the questions may be, well, how, how did he become crippled? Um, we'll put this on the screen. It's in 2 Samuel chapter 4. And it says this, Jonathan, son of Saul, had a son who was crippled in his feet. He was five years old. The news about Saul and Jonathan came from Jezreel. And his nurse, his, his nanny, if you would, took him up and fled. As she fled in her haste, he fell. And he became lame. His name was Mephibosheth. And so in the process of trying to run away, because once again, the new king will kill everybody. That's the process. And the, the nanny knew that, and so she grabbed him, and she's carrying him. And if you've, you've, you've been with five-year-olds, five-year-olds don't move as fast as you wish. If you're picking up what I'm putting down, would you say Amen. I mean, they just don't, they, you wish that they'd move a little quicker. And I'm sure she was holding him by the hand, and she, the kid tripped, and he probably broke his legs. And they never healed back. Remember, I said to you, I'm not like David, I'm like Mephibosheth. Because you know what the Bible describes me like? And just so that I don't feel alone. You know what the Bible describes you and me like? Separate from God? Do you know how we're just... Romans 3. We'll, I, 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 we'll read this, but I would just encourage you, if you don't have this marked in your Bible, you should. Notice some words that I'm going to put an emphasis on. As it is written, none is righteous. No, not one. No one understands no one seeks for god all have turned aside together they've become worthless no one does good not even one their throat is an open grave they use their tongues to deceive the venom of asp is under their lips their mouth is full of curses and bitterness their feet are swift to shed blood and their paths are ruin and misery and the way of peace they've not known there is no fear of God for their eyes you know what that's describing clump 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 We are broken. We don't have anything to offer. Most moral person in this room. You could have gone to church all your life and had stars next to your name for every Sunday school class you've ever been to. Broken. Later in Romans in chapter 6, in verse 23, it says this, the wages of one sin death but the free gift of God grace is eternal life in Jesus Christ our Lord go back to 2 Samuel 9 and verse 5 then King David sent 
he hears he's in the place of no pasture. And verse 5, he sent and brought him from the house of Machir, the son of Amigo at Lodabar. Now, wait, 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 wait. Can you picture that for just a moment? That, that Mephibosheth has intentionally been put in ten book two, and now there's a knock. And they come to the door, and soldiers are at the door, and the soldiers say, is, is Mephibosheth here? Well, he can't run. He couldn't hide. Had he tried to hide, they would have found him. Is Mephibosheth here? Yes. The king wants you. Do you understand what's going on in his head? My life will be over soon. I am facing the wages of sin is death. I am facing impending judgment. There was a food critic, um, Paul Grinberg, set out to eat at the top 100 restaurants in the world. Since 2011, he has had meals to this point in 99 of the top 100 restaurants in the world. He's gone down mountain roads, been lost in fog, been snowed in, stranded, secured speeding tickets in Spain, France, Switzerland, and Germany, which speaks a lot about how he drives. He has crisscrossed time zones, fought exhaustion, but the last restaurant on his list, a small members-only sushi house in Japan, has remained maddeningly out of reach. Grinberg told the Wall Street Journal, I can't get into one restaurant in Tokyo. It's just crazy. What's the problem? Sushi Sato, an eight-seat restaurant in Tokyo, has a private membership. Outsiders have to either dine with a member or have a member make their reservation. Tracking down a connection has not been easy. Mr. Grinberg has tapped pals at Goldman Sachs, uh, Morgan Stanley, and other investment banks. He's tried contacts at American Express, Japanese car makers, and hedge funds. No luck. Mr. Grinberg doesn't understand it. To reach his top 100 goal, he said, other restaurants and chefs have gone out of their way to accommodate him by staying open after hours or squeezing him into a fully booked room. He documents his meals on Instagram where he begged for a hookup. Can anyone help me with number 100, Sushi Sato? Can you imagine Mephibosheth on his way, wondering, could anyone help me? I just want to know, or is it over? He has no idea what's about to happen. Watch verse 5, excuse me, verse 6. Mephibosheth, the son of Jonathan, son of Saul, came to David, fell on his face, and paid homage. Grace is received. David said, Mephibosheth? He answered, Behold, I am your servant. David said to him, Do not fear, for I will show you kindness. Hesed, grace, for the sake of your father Jonathan, and I will restore to you all the land of Saul your father, and you shall eat at my table always. Mephibosheth should have felt a cold blade against his neck, but instead he feels a warm embrace. When Mephibosheth stands before King David, two things happen. First, in verse number seven, he says, Do not fear. David says, do not fear. David relieves him from fear of judgment. Do you know what every person in this room deserves? Hell. Hell. I've, look, I've heard all kinds of descriptions of hell, and none of them are places I want to go. Okay, I believe that hell is a place of eternal judgment, eternal pain, eternal torment. But I've heard all kinds of descriptions of hell. And one thing I've determined is none of them are good. And what you find at the beginning here is David says, the judgment that you think you're about to have, it, mercy. 
Then he not only receives mercy, but grace goes further than mercy. Watch verse 7. He says, For I will show you kindness for the sake of your father, Jonathan. He, he says, David promises grace. And how does he do it? Watch verse 8. Uh, he says, For I will restore to you all the land of Saul your father, and you will eat at my table always. He promises grace. He restores land to Mephibosheth. So everything that Saul had before he died, he was the king. David says, I'm giving you everything Saul had. So Mephibosheth went from having nothing to having something. And not only did he have something, he had a ton. He went for, to being in Israel to being on the top ten list of one of the most wealthy people in all of the land. And he went from Lodabar, no pasture, to being on the top ten in a flash. And, and the most important thing is that at the end of verse 7, he says, and you will eat at my table always. He says, you also now have a new relationship. You're going to be with me. You're going to eat at my table. And you're going to eat at my table every day. What a picture that is. And I would propose to you that was heard but not understood. Corey Ten Boom, who I would say to you, if you've never read much about her, you should. Um, she made this statement. She said, God takes our sins, the past, present, and future, and he dumps them in the sea puts up a sign that says no fishing there's a pastor friend of mine he had a couple of daughters and he was counseling a person and he shared this with me with permission he said a man came into my study not too long ago and his daughter was going to marry a young man he didn't like he said if my daughter marries that man I'll disown her I said you don't mean that you love her let me tell you something, sir. My daughters can't do anything that will cause me to disown them. Nothing. There's absolutely nothing in this world that Robin and Jennifer can do that will ever cause me to disown them. What have I done? I've forgiven them of their past. They're my daughters. I've forgiven them their present. They're my daughters. And no matter what they do in the future, they will still be my daughters. They will be forgiven. And if we can do that as earthly parents, imagine how much more so that is true of God. And what, 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 watch verse 8. Because what this is, here's, David, here's Mephibosheth's response. He paid homage and he says, What is your servant that you should show regard for a dead dog such as I? Look, look I know that's, I'm about to say this, that some of you who really love dogs aren't going to get really mad at me. But, and I love dogs. We have a great dog. Even though some days we would give it away. I, 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 I would want you to know Israelites did not think much of dogs. When you look at dogs in the scripture, they are not spoken highly of. Philistines love dogs. Israelites, no. It's the one thing I like about Philistines. They weren't cat people. Okay? Israelites... He says, I'm like a dead dog. Mephibosheth, what did he say? What's he saying? He's saying, I don't deserve any of this. What is this? This is blowing his mind. It should. Because watch this. Grace is being experienced. Look at chapter 9, verse 9. And the king, called Ziba, Saul's servant he said to him hey 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 hey, everything that belonged to Saul and to all this house I'm like, I've given to your master's grandson you and your sons and your servants shall till the land for him and shall bring in the produce that your master's grandsons may have bread to eat but Mephibosheth your master's grandsons even though I'm giving you all this here's the second time it said they shall always notice that phrase always eat at my table the second time what's David say making it very clear the biggest thing I'm giving Mephibosheth is he's with me 
he's with me. Mephibosheth would never earn or experience any of the, the blessings from that land. He would be treated as one of his sons. When grace is received, a couple of things happen. We are adopted into Christ's family, and we are an heir with him. Uh, I'm going to ask you to take your Bibles and turn to this passage. Keep your finger in 2 Samuel 9. We're not done there. But go with me to Romans chapter 8. Off to your side. Romans chapter 8. Look at verse 14. Those of you who don't have a Bible, we will put it on the screen. But if you have a Bible, I really want you to look at this. Romans 8. Look at verse 14. It says this. For all who are led by the Spirit of God, they are sons of God. Sons of God. You did not receive the spirit of slavery to fall back into fear. You've received a spirit of adoption as sons. Adopted. By whom we cry, Abba, Daddy. And the Spirit Himself bears witness with our spirit that we are, third time, children of God. And if we're children, guess what? We're heirs. We're heirs of God. We're fellow heirs with Christ. Provided we suffer with Him. In order that we all may also be glorified with Him. See, Mephibosheth didn't just receive, not receive what he deserved, judgment. But now he comes to a table every evening it's David's table with his kids and so maybe sitting at that table is Tamar one of David's daughters Absalom good looking fella maybe there's an Adonijah who's there who would one day be king for a short term and then there would be Mephibosheth. Grace gives blessing and it gives relationship. Do you know what's interesting about sitting at the table? Is when these folks are sitting and they're not like they are right now, they, you know, unmasked and they're actually eating, you don't know who's who. I can't tell the difference between Absalom and Mephibosheth. I can't tell who's a cripple because the table covering covers the limbs. It removes the swaggers, it removes our pride. just able to sit at a table and recognize I'm at the Lord's table you know that's what grace does one of these days by God's grace by God's grace I'll be in heaven and I'll experience the fullness the completion of what he's going to do in my life when that Fullness is experience. All of sin will be removed. Look forward to that day. But in the meantime, and the great thing about church is we have these pictures that we get to come and let the table of God's grace cover our sins it does it covers us I know these guys and some of y'all do too from Andrew to Rachel to Jackson to Joe and even if it were, were for our four other folks who were sitting there before the service I said can we sit up here and I'd already had four people it doesn't matter who's sitting at the table you know what we all need? Grace. 
grace. And when you look at the king's table, everyone does look the same. The same. Grace is needed by us all. It's deserved by no one. What is deserved is justice. When I, uh, in 1986, I received a phone call from my mom, and I remember the phone call was a phone call that I knew I was in trouble. And I don't know how many of you have ever, you know what that's like. And I, I had just opened a bank account at Northwest Georgia Bank. And I'd had it open for about six months. And the bank account that I had opened, my mom said, call me. When I called her, I called her, and she said to me, the bank called here, and you have bounced a check. I didn't know much, but I knew that wasn't good. Now, I had a second problem, which was I was broke. Okay? And I remember saying to my mom in 1986, Mom, I have a problem. Her response was, I know, and we've already put money in. Now she had every she would have had every right to say it's your account. Suck it up. This is called adulting. What, what did she do? She paid a debt I could have never paid. I didn't have the ability to pay. Clump. 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 And she loved me anyhow. whether you are as broken as you think you are or not, you're broken. And every one of us in this room needs the grace of Jesus Christ to be in right relationship with him. Would you bow your heads with me? want to ask a very clear, simple, quick question. Have you put your faith in Jesus? Is he who you are fully depending upon? You recognize your brokenness. I want to encourage you right now to call on him If you don't know that you have a personal relationship with Jesus Christ, I want to ask you right now to call on him. There's no, uh, there's no right words. But the Bible does say that if you'll confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus and believe in your heart that God raised Jesus from the dead, you can be saved. You need to call on him and, and let him know that you're turning from your sin. You're asking him to be in charge of your life. You have nothing to bring to him, and yet he is able to give you grace. I want to encourage you right now. Call on him. Ask him, Lord, I need you. believe your grace is greater than all my sin I'm asking you to save me 
turning from my sin. I'm turning to you. I want to encourage you right now to do that. I want you to know that if you do that, grace is that he will save you. Let us know you choose to do this today. Father, I love you. I thank you for loving us. I thank you for your faithfulness to us. I thank you for grace. I pray, Father, that, Lord, today you would help us. We would draw near to you, be open to you. Thank you for your love and for your mercy. Help us to be people who've received the message of grace. In Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Every week we are encouraging folks to take their next step in the relationship with the Lord. And uh, today maybe there's a step that you need to take. And we would love to help you receive the grace of God. And uh, we have a couple places to go. If you'd like to talk with somebody, uh, Pastor Bobby will be over here at this table. He'd be glad to talk to you after the service about your decision that you're making. One of our elders is at the back of the room at our next steps table. And and uh, if we can help in any way, we would love to do that. Don't hesitate to make your way to any, either of those places. And maybe you've made a decision and you'd like to let us know on the uh, Connect card, but you don't have one, you can uh, use our virtual Connect card by texting the word CONNECT to 812-214-1987. We have a couple of announcements that are, that are mentioned as we try to make you aware of some things that are going on uh, here. They're in your bulletin. But... Uh, couple of things coming up very soon is one we have a ministry we call gap it stands for graduates and professionals it's a ministry to young adults and uh, they are relaunching again on march 21st at 6 p.m in the student center if you're in that group or know somebody who is uh, we'd love for you to be a part of that uh, you can uh, sign up on your connect card to let us know that you're going um, they will have a time of worship uh, they're doing a study of joshua and having a dessert and they're inviting you to bring games if you'd like to play uh, games to be a part of that um, we'd love for you to sign up sign up on your connect card or if you would like more information you can see Andrew Patton who's seated here at the table you can talk with uh, him uh, for more details four times a year we have town hall meetings where we do church business we try to make everyone aware of what's going on so that we're on the same page we have one coming up on March 7th after the 1045 service we encourage all of our members to uh, be a part of that the student ministry is having a an adult prom uh, on March 13th at 6 p.m. Tickets are on sale right now. The cost is $20, and uh, we would love for you to sign up for that. You can find one of our students. Pastor Matt can help you get tickets, and we'd love for you to attend that. Also, our next Northwoods class is coming up. This is our class where people learn more information about what it means to be a member here. It's coming up on March the 14th. We did have to slide that a day because of a conflict that we have March the 14th after the 1045 service. It's a free lunch, and if you'd like to be a part of that, uh, we would love for you to be. You can sign up on the back of your Connect card. And we're going to be receiving an offering this morning. We'll do it at the doors, as we, uh, we have been doing. Uh, you can drop your Connect card, your offerings, or tithes in any of those boxes. Uh, you can also give online through our website um, by going to northwoodschurch.org slash giving. Or you can text to give by texting the word GIVE to 812-214-1987. I did that this morning. I know it works. So uh, we'd love for you to participate in that way. Uh, our church is in a prayer emphasis where we're praying uh, for various uh, things throughout the year, and we're praying uh, the armor of God right now. And so as we close our time together, we're going to pray uh, for the armor of God to protect us. So would you stand with us, and let's close our time together in prayer. So grateful that you came this morning and, and hope your day is, is good. All right, let's pray together. Father, we are so grateful for your grace. Lord, all of us are standing in need of it, and we are so grateful that we have received grace in Christ. And Lord, I pray that you would help us to be those who live in your grace, and we would extend it to those around us, that we would be a people who are just marked by this lavish grace that we not only do not give judgment to people, but we show kindness to people, that we go out of our way to love and serve people. 
And Father, I pray that you would protect us in this world. Help us to be those who keep alert in a spirit of prayer. Uh, Lord, that we would pray and pray for one another, and that's how we stay alert to the attacks of the devil. And I pray that you would help us to be those who battle for one another this, this week. Lord, we uh, thank you for this time we've had together. Thank you for your word that speaks to us and uh, this group of people that we have the privilege of being in fellowship with. In Jesus' name, amen. Thanks, everybody. You're dismissed.